Okay, so we'll start with uh, Refuge and Bodhicitta again. And uh, if you don't know the prayer or you don't agree with the prayer, just take a minute to make your motivation altruistic. questions and that it's your job to kind of explore and expand what you think the answer is to that question based on your own personal experience and just kind of look into your own version of each of these six realms and uh, notice how they don't help your life actually be happier so it's really um, trying to clarify what you already know about yourself and these analytical meditations can be really useful for building your wisdom. Okay, so um, start by getting a nice posture where your back is straight. <laughs> And just sit in such a way where it doesn't feel like a strain or an effort. And so if it seems like work to sit up straight, then adjust your cushion so it's supporting your tailbone better. And then just bring your awareness to your whole body, scanning from the top of your head all the way down to the tip of your toes, allowing any tension to release and settle, and just become very grounded and present in your body for a moment. And then with the sound of the bell, shift your focus to the breath.
And I'll try to adopt the mental attitude that your breath is something very interesting to watch. Something that you can absorb your attention into. Different thoughts will come and go. You make the choice not to agree or disagree with your own thoughts. Not to fixate on some or push others away. Just let the thoughts be and keep coming back to the breath as your main object of interest. Land your attention right there on that experience of breathing. And catch yourself if you start to drift or to sink. Keep choosing the breath. And see if you can try not to become obsessed with distractions or to push them away aggressively. Distractions are only natural. Just keep coming back to the breath. And now shift from single-pointedness to analysis. Start by first thinking of this concept of a god realm. But take it into this human experience that you have right now. Try to picture a time when life was going very well and things were easy. and you were maybe feeling very proud of your possessions or your accomplishments. Even if it was only a day, just try and remember that mental space that is full of pride, over-identified with possessions or accomplishments, looking down on others in some way. Just search through your memories and your own understanding of yourself to find that place. Start by just identifying it.
when I'm in this proud mental space? Am I more likely to be defensive or sarcastic, condescending or patronizing? Do I use my words in a way that creates distance with others, holding myself above them in some way? Just be curious without judgment. If I'm in a group of people, and I think that I'm a little bit better than all of them, do I separate myself somehow from them? <clears throat> and then as a result, feel isolated, alienated and alone. Try and think of examples of what the disadvantage of pride is for you yourself. It can be quite obvious how it harms others. But how does pride hurt you? For example, do you become easily offended? Does it seem like people are disrespecting you? Always on the lookout for how you're appearing to others. There can become an obsession with reputation. So much effort to maintain this appearance what pride says you need to be. Try to contrast that with times when you let it go, when you realize that there is a way in which you are the same as everyone else, when you feel at one with humanity. Relaxed with strangers, relaxed with humble people, relaxed with educated people, connected to rich or poor, just comfortable in your own humanity and in your own skin. So try and just remember a time when you let go of your pride and how happy and relaxed that made you.
And then shift to thinking of times when you're more like this demigod. With some resources, some accomplishments, but still very obsessed with reputation, comparison and competitiveness. And your mind has gotten jealous. Always looking at what others have that you don't. The mind that keeps going back and forth between yourself and others. You might mentally tear them down and think of ways that they are not really good. Different mental strategies to comfort yourself. Different negative behaviors of speech, criticizing others out of jealousy. Just try and identify what are you like as an individual when jealousy has taken over for a while. Even if it's not an affliction that comes up very often. Just try and find it somewhere in your past or in your knowledge of yourself. What is it like when it's present? This jealous mind. What sort of things happen in your mind when you're jealous? Do you say, why do they always? Why can't I ever? Maybe you mistake your ideas about jealousy for ideas about justice. And you say to yourself, it's not fair that they... And then again, just compare that to a time when you've simply been happy for what is going well with others. When you see their accomplishments, or you see their possessions, and you think how wonderful that they have that. I'm so glad for them. Just try and remember the sort of peace that comes to your mind when you're comparing in a healthy way times when that person was unhappy to now when they're happier not between you and them you might even see ways in which they're better than you and feel inspired by that instead of competitive Try and remember what a freedom it is to move out of jealousy.
and then moving into the human experience, which is primarily dictated by desire. It's not just that you want to be happy, you want to be happier and happier. Just an underlying hunger or an underlying discontent. Not quite satisfied. So try and remember a time when you've especially been consumed by desire, when you've completely given up your power to external objects or people or situations, and decided that you needed things to be a certain way in order to be happy. And because of that decision, you couldn't be happy unless all of those components came together. Just trying to catch the lies we tell ourselves. Try to notice the way this mind makes you self-centered and self-absorbed. All your thoughts about yourself, all your conversations about what you need and want. Not noticing what's going on for other people. Which can be alienating for them and isolating for you. And then try to remember a time when you've released expectations, when you've let go of a pressured mind, when you were able to just let things be as they are and enjoy them as they are, even if it was only 90% there, even if it was just occasionally, try to remember that state of mind that just releases into satisfaction. The mind that stopped putting pressure on the present moment and stopped comparing it to edited versions of the past. or fantasized hopes about the future. When you were just here with what is and enjoying it.
and then dedicate the merit of this practice to moving from samsaric states of mind to more liberated states of mind, all the way into complete enlightenment for the benefit of all living beings. So we just did the, what are called the three upper realms, and then next we'll do the three lower realms. But it's, it can be useful to do them separately, um, just because it's hard to stay focused for too long. So it's easy to kind of drift into sleep and kind of lose mental sharpness and clarity. So if you're at home doing um, practice, say you have a long time free where you're able to practice, try not to force yourself to practice that whole time. Give yourself regular breaks so that you stay fresh. Um, so before we do the three lower realms, um, do you have any questions about that one or um, interesting ideas that came up? Were you able to identify pride, jealousy, and desire within yourself, or was there one that you couldn't quite pinpoint? Do you remember some moments of pride? She feels more open, more mm. caring and loving. So um, it's maybe confidence, not pride. Yeah. Confidence. Yeah. Confidence. Yeah. Confidence. The confidence is good. Pride is bad. <laughs> because, um, and you can tell the difference because pride is looking down. Whereas confidence is just seeing yourself and your potential and being happy with that. Okay. Yeah. And it's quite steady. You're not very fragile when you're confident. You know, you can be quite assertive, you can make mistakes, you can speak in public, you know, you just feel confident, settled. Um, whereas pride, you might seem confident on the surface, but if someone challenges you, you're very quickly defensive. Um, or you very quickly go into self-loathing and think that you're bad. So I guess a good um, test whether it's confidence or pride is what happens if you're challenged. Um, when you're challenged and you're in a confident state of mind, it's sort of fun, you know? You can be like, oh, let's have an argument, yeah, let's go. Yeah. Um, let's uh, share ideas together and let's kind of play. You, know? um, you see this with a lot of our um, geshis in our tradition, where as soon as people start to argue with them, they're so happy. Like, yeah, wisdom comes from arguing, woo! Yeah. Um, and you see um, pride a lot in maybe um, a charismatic self-help speaker, you know, who's doing a seminar somewhere. And someone might question an aspect of their theory. And they immediately kind of attack the audience member and say, you know, what do you know? You're lying to yourself. Um, or they uh, become defensive about where they learned their training. And they say, I've been doing this for 30 years, and I've been doing that for 30 years. And they have to give you their whole history of employment and education as a proof for their self-worth. You know, that's right. You know that feeling when you feel like you need to um, explain how you came to your opinion um, through like describing your CV or your resume? You know? You know that feeling when you feel like you need to be like, look, I've done this, I've done this. You know? um, rather than, oh, okay, you have an argument about my idea, let's play with this idea together. You know? It's a really different headspace, and I think we go back and forth between the two, don't we? Yeah. So it sounds like what you're describing was confidence. Because you do, you feel really warm and connected to people when you're confident. Yeah, other ideas or questions? So he says that when he has found a moment in the past, that in jealousy or whatever, he notices or he realizes that 
that was not the only moment that more and even more recently he has somehow fallen into these states of mind without realizing that. Mm -hmm. So somehow he says this makes me or forces me to be more attentive, to pay more attention to what I am feeling mm -hmm. and so forth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, what meditation does. Is yes, at first you sort of realize, oh my gosh, this happens all the time. Whereas before you thought, oh yeah, sometimes, sure. <laughs> but now you have self-awareness and you go, oh my god. <laughs> and you might tell your partner or your friends, do you know, sometimes I think I'm jealous a lot. And they go, yeah, I know. <laughs> or you say, I have so much pride. And they go, I know, darling. <laughs> so if they knew the whole time, <laughs> you're just sort of realizing. <laughs> Um, but I think that's also the, the benefit of um, mindfulness and self-awareness is that um, when you see yourself really clearly, you realize how absurd you are and it's hard to take yourself too seriously. And it makes you kind of have this affection for people because you see their absurdity as well. And you see the way we're just trying to do the best we can with really mixed motivations and really confused ideas, but we're trying, you know? And it kind of um, makes you feel like poignancy for the human condition, you know? Like, oh, sentient beings, we really struggle, don't we? <laughs> you know? So, um, if it's making you open your heart and it's making you even entertained a little bit, then it's going the right way. If your self-awareness is making you feel like a really bad person and like a lost cause and, you know, really you're starting to get depressed by seeing how much work there is to do on your mind, then it's going the wrong way. But uh, the beginning of meditation practice and the beginning of Dharma practice, and by the beginning I mean, you know, the first 20 years, I don't know, but uh, the beginning, <laughs> um, it's, it's just really, you're embarrassed the whole time, really. Just like, wow, it's a lot of work to be done here. <laughs> and, uh, but better to know, <laughs> better to know than to not know. Or maybe the first 20 lifetimes. And, <laughs> At least we're aware now, right? <laughs> Before we were like this and suffering and causing suffering and we had no idea why. So at least now we know. Mm -hmm. um, so antidotes. Um, antidotes can just be self-awareness. You know, you notice you're getting locked in pride, or you notice you're swept up in desire. Sometimes noticing is enough to kind of kill the energy. Just noticing it sort of falls apart. Um, sometimes it's uh, too strong a habit for just awareness to be enough to cut it. So in that case, um, it works to do a bit of additional analysis in a quiet moment when you're not too stirred up. So your analysis could be just a casual reflection, you know, it doesn't have to be too structured, it just needs to be focused on one topic so that your mind doesn't go all over the place. So you're at home by yourself, having a quiet day, and you think, I'm just going to think about working on my pride. The antidote to pride is remembering how other people all have something to offer that I haven't learned yet. You know, it's really thinking about uh, dependent arising. That so everything I'm good at, everything I have, came through connection and support of others. So you can be really happy in what you've accomplished and what you know and what you have, but you're not having that excessive ownership feeling or that excessive identification feeling. You know, you're realizing that, okay, you know, maybe you're smart and articulate, but that's because your parents taught you many things when you were young, and you had a good education, and you had many supports, and okay, so you wound up like this, it's good, but it's not like yours, so it's hard to kind of, you know, look down on people then. Um, and so then the people that maybe you have a tendency to look down on, you try to consciously think of things they do better than you. Even if it's something that you don't particularly value, it could be like, well, they can fix cars, I can't fix cars. 
but it's something that they can do that you can't because it helps settle down your pride. You know, like uh, little ants can carry so much more body of their percentage of their body weight than we can. That's amazing. Now you can't look down on ants. Yeah, for example. You know, cockroaches will survive the apocalypse. We might not. You know, it's like amazing. Um, so I think it's, it's really useful to do this kind of work in a quiet time when you're not too stirred up, where you really kind of make a project of one of your afflictions and think, let's just think around why this state of mind is actually not logic-based and not functional. Because then the next time it starts to come up, my self-awareness will be enough to shatter it apart. Right now I don't have enough momentum behind my awareness for just that awareness alone to be what makes it fall apart. But if you do prior analysis, eventually it will be. That makes sense? So the antidote to jealousy then is rejoicing, is consciously thinking how wonderful they have this or can do that. Which sounds a bit cheesy, you know, it can sound a bit kind of artificial and even a bit stupid to like sit down and oh, isn't it great, they have a nice garden, <laughs> you know, like who cares, you know, you can get kind of cynical doing this really easily. Um, and uh, Lama Zopa is so adorable when he does this practice, no one can get away with this, it would sound too American, but he goes, oh, how wonderful it is, how precious it is that they have this and they have that, and he says it with such heartfelt way that you're right there with him, but if anyone else were to do it, you'd be like, oh my god, this is so cheesy. Right? Gross. Right? You'd hate it. So what you have to do is find a way to make it genuine. Yeah? Where you really consciously think, do you know what? Like, never mind my feeling that this is kind of plastic or kind of Oprah Winfrey special or something like that. Like, let me take a minute and think. It actually is wonderful that this person I'm jealous of knows how to do this and this that I don't know how to do. Because actually it reminds me how cool a skill that is and inspires me to do the same. Yeah, so instead of being jealous of them, why don't I just work on the same skill that I want? Yeah, or if I think so-and-so has such a beautiful marriage, my marriage is so complicated and exhausting. Oh, why do they get the good marriage and I have the crap marriage? And you're all sort of jealous about it. You could just think how wonderful someone has a good marriage in this world. How rare it is for people to communicate well. Yeah, never mind comparison. Let's just take a moment and be happy there's a little pocket of peace somewhere. You know, it can actually uplift your mind. But, you know, you can't force it, otherwise you'll kind of have a cringe. It'll feel too sweet. Yeah. You know that feeling like, it's too sweet. You know, so it has to be real. But to, to see the benefit of it is actually to have more energy for it. Once you do it a little bit, you'll see that it actually does work a bit. And then you can really relax your jealousy so easily by just thinking, I'm so glad they can do that. So we have to find a way to sincerely get ourselves into happy for when things are going well for people um, by consciously rejoicing. It's just, it's tricky. Yeah, it takes, it takes some, a little bit of mental gymnastics to do it in a way that's authentic. But it does work, that's the thing. It really does work once you're doing it well. And then you're not competitive so much anymore. And when these little pockets of jealousy come up, because of course they'll still keep coming up, they just won't come up as often. When they do come up, it's, it's like a juicy project to work on. Like, oh, there it is. Oh, that hasn't come up for a while. All right, let's work on this. Yeah. Does it make sense? And then for desire, you know, it, really it sounds too simplistic, but you just meditate on contentment, which is like a gratitude meditation, you know, that maybe someone taught you to do in Sunday school when you were four years old or something. Think of all the good you have, think of your blessings. Again, it sounds really cheesy and a bit too sweet. Um, you know, it sounds too simple, but we don't actually have a lot of experience of sitting ourselves down and doing it because we're too smart, right? We're too smart for our own good, so we understand how it might work were we to do it, but we've not actually ever sat ourselves down and said, actually, my mental health is not too bad, my physical health is not too bad. That is actually quite significant. How much of the world has some difficulty with their mental health or some difficulty with their physical health? I'm really, really fortunate, oh my god. 
and it's temporary, so I better use it. You know, and to think, okay, actually, I have a lot of good, solid friends. That is a big deal, actually. This world is full of isolated, sad, lonely people. Even having one friend is a huge, huge deal. You know, etc. Right? So you're sitting yourself down and saying, okay, stop being too smart for your own good. Stop being too cynical. Actually list what is going well with you and why it's actually quite significant in terms of enabling your spiritual path. Yeah? Because then you can, again, let go of a lot of this hunger that's with us all the time, or this craving that's with us all the time. Like, I'm happy enough, but I'd be happier if, fill in the blank. Yeah, because we always have this, look, it's fine, life is fine, I'm not suffering so much, but things will really be good when. And we're like putting off happiness for some complete picture in our mind, which probably will never be achieved exactly as we want it. And even if it is, it won't have the effect that we assume. You know? So instead of delaying happiness, you kind of take the happiness that you have and expand it by really owning how good it is. Does it make sense? So meditating on contentment is really important for developing the antidote to desire. There are a lot of other antidotes to these three, but those are kind of three classic antidotes to three classic afflictions that will hopefully keep you out of the samsaric version of these three realms. So, questions about those or comments? And then we'll do the three lower ones. Okay. Nice straight back. Again, just be with your physical experience to reground yourself. And then revive your bodhicitta motivation. Just putting it back into your own words. What is an altruistic reason for doing this meditation? the sound of the bell, shift your focus back to the breath. And see if you can stay focused on 10 breaths in a row without losing your attention. No need to be tight or tense about it, but just see if you can remain steadily present with 10 breaths.
if you lose attention, you just start back with one. It's not about being successful, it's just about starting to concentrate. and shift from single-pointedness to analysis. By first thinking about this concept of a hungry ghost realm. Within the framework of the human experience, the mind that has become obsessed or addicted, that has become greedy or miserly, afraid of losing with what one has and is always planning to accumulate and hoard. Whether it's material things or obsession with a certain situation or person. Just try and identify this mental state that becomes fixated and tight. It could be the side of yourself that can become needy or melancholy. Wanting validation. Really hungry for support and recognition. It could become the one that is obsessed with planning and trying to achieve a stability. Not with just a practical mind, but with an obsessed mind. Becoming a control freak. It could be the mind that starts to watch one television show and then winds up watching ten in a row. It thinks to have just one glass of wine but winds up with five. So whatever the form it takes doesn't really matter. Just try and find that mentality.
and then make a comparison with yourself about those times when you felt very generous and abundant and happy to share. When maybe someone asked to borrow something of yours and you were so happy that you had it and could share it. Or when someone requested advice and you were so happy that you had time and energy to share it. So just make a comparison with that other side of yourself that is expansive, that feels wealth, that is happy to share. And then shift to thinking about what the mind of an animal might be like, whose whole existence is pervaded by ignorance. <clears throat> Not knowing about life and death, but still obsessed with procreation. Full of fear, with no internal refuge. able to learn very basic things, but unable to develop wisdom. So try and think of yourself in that framework, times when you've been in like a fog, distracted or disassociated. or very obsessed with ordinary worldly things like food, or with sensory pleasures, consumption of all kinds. So just try and touch that part of your mind that is like an animal. And when you find it, try to ask very clearly how does this limit my experience? And how does this limit my potential? And then try to think that that part of yourself that really enjoys thinking deeply of coming into contact with new ideas, that enjoys learning, that enjoys connecting with other people and other minds in higher ways.
part of you that has joy with growth. And so the animal realm mind has a type of contentment and happiness. But compare that with the more high happiness that comes from learning and connection. Of development and growth. And then explore that part of your mind that is like a hell realm. When it becomes full of anger, the type that is like fire, or the type that is like ice. And just examine and identify yourself when you're boiling mad or freezing angry. Try not to get swept up in your reasons for becoming angry. Try and instead just look at the experience, the impact it has on your body and mind, the way it hurts you. It's like you are punishing yourself with your own fire or creating a prison for your heart surrounded by ice. And even there are many good things in your life, it becomes very difficult to see them or connect with them. We can be angry about circumstances or angry about physical pain, but most of the time we're angry about other people. And usually that anger is related to an attachment that didn't get what it wanted. 
we expected something from them that they were not prepared to give. Or we expected a stability from them that was impossible for them to have. We put demands on them and then they disappointed us by not living up to our exaggeration. And so we are blaming other people for agreements they didn't make. It feels like they broke a promise. But most of the time they never agreed to that promise. And so when attachment is disappointed, it turns into anger. When love is disappointed, it turns into compassion. So just notice the way anger hurts yourself and alienates you from others. And then think about those times when your mind has either been driven by patience, or by love, or by wisdom. And someone did something unexpected, even bad, and you maintained your mental peace. Just try and reconnect with that power that you can feel, and that stability when other people's bad behavior doesn't affect your peace of mind. When you can see the suffering underneath their affliction and the ignorance underneath their suffering and the universality of ignorance itself. And dedicate the energy of this practice to staying out of the three lower realms and developing your fullest potential in order to have all others do the same. So um, we'll have a 10-minute break.